Now I start by saying how happy I am to be here at the very same institution where I started my academic career. Um, this slide here gives you a brief overview of the plans I've been over the last 10 years. So I started chemistry here at Technico. Then I moved to Stuttgart, which is this building there. And I did a PhD in Abinitio. Uh, after the PhD, I joined Lind Engineering, where I changed the focus of my work and I did thermodynamics and physical properties. And since August last year, I joined the Helmholtz Institute. This is not the correct building, but it's nearby. So, um, so let's give a bit more detail in each one of these stages and what I've done so far. So technically is where everything started. I did a master's in chemistry, mainly in organic chemistry and spectroscopy. And for those of you that saw the title of the presentation that I'm a computational chemist and see, uh, experimental things. Yes, I was in the lab. Some people here still remember that. Uh, but it was a master's also where I had my first contact with computational methods. And here it took place in two main projects. The first one, uh, in the first year of the master's, I worked together with Professor Kuznetsov on the cycle addition reactions of nitrons to isocyanides. Uh, Maxim gave an amazing presentation last May, so I'm not going to give any more details on this. The other project was the master's thesis itself. I worked with Lumino, which is this molecule here. And luminol, in the presence of a suitable oxidant, it generates a molecule in an excited state and it gives rise to this amazing blue light, very characteristic. And together with Professor Vage, I characterized the reaction mechanism and we also did some PD, PFT to understand better the properties of the excited states. And with this luggage of experimental and introduction to computational methods, I then moved to the University of Stuttgart to have a view on quantum chemistry from the perspective of the actual theoretician, not the applied theoretician. And here I did have an issue and I used local correlation to reduce the computational costs of these methods. <clears throat> For you to well understand what was done, I need to clarify two concepts. The first one is the one of multi-reference. Quantum chemists calculate orbitals, these orbitals have energies, and the moment we have orbitals with energies, oops, sorry, we start assigning electrons. So we have orbitals, energies, and we start assigning electrons. To each electronic assignment of which uh, configuration we have there, you generate a wave function, which corresponds to, um, to a, an, electron an electronic configuration. And this is basically what we call the hartley fock wave function. It works acceptably for many cases. Uh, there are, however, a few molecules that cannot be described by a single uh, electronic configuration. So what we do, we excite electrons, we generate other electronic configurations, and we obtain a new and more refined wave function that we use to characterize these molecules. So multi-reference is basically a molecule that cannot be described by a single electronic configuration. Typical cases are nitrogen dioxide. This radical, we can put the unpaired electron on, a nitrogen, on the nitrogen atom or in, on each one of the oxygen atoms, and it generates multiple configurations. Uh, other typical cases are ozone, that is small molecules, a lot of interest for many chemists or chemical engineers. Transition metal complexes, you have variable occupation in the d orbitals, and these gives rise typically to several electronic configurations. Carbenes, particularly the low spin carbenes, the singlet carbenes, are classical multi reference cases, and you need these methods to get uh, a proper description of the electronic properties of the molecules. And of course, electronic excited stage, uh, states, which are the main applications of these kind of methods. The other concept is local correlation. What is this? When a quantum chemist calculates the orbitals using the specific equations for that, we don't put any restriction on the orbitals. They are free to occupy as much space as they want, and they can do, indeed do so. If you take a molecule like uh, exatrine there, you will have orbitals that go from the first carbon all the way to the last carbon, and they basically occupy the whole molecular surface. This is not a drastic case because it's a small molecule. If you take an equal complex like this one here, you're going to have orbitals that go from the very top to the very bottom, left, right, and this orbital is huge. So the electron has the whole molecular space uh, available to it. And when we try to calculate the interactions between electrons, because the electrons occupy the whole space, there's nothing we can do. We need to calculate each and every possible interaction. And this is expensive from the computational point of view. So we apply a very neat mathematical trick. We rotate the orbitals 
in a way that they span two plus three atoms. And this is very powerful because we recover the Lewis picture of chemical bonding. And suddenly we can start saying, I have a pair of electrons up here. I have another pair of electrons down there. And if this distance is long enough, I can simply neglect the interaction without losing uh, accuracy. And the main in information here, or the, the, the point here is that by neglecting, I can reduce the cost. If I take this nickel complex and I go to the parent method that uh, I work with, irrespective of the computer that you choose, cluster, doesn't really matter, you cannot do this. You won't be able to do this in the years to come because this is so cumbersome. If you apply a local correlation, six hours in the cluster and you're done. Now, this is a bit um, it's not specific. Let's particularize a bit more for you to see the effects of local correlation. Uh, this is a old plot from the PhD times, but basically the method that I work with is CASPT2, which is the multi-reference variant for molar classes, so it's perturbation theory. And you can see that this method scales, and this plot shows a computational cost against the size of the molecule. And as a reference, we took this alkyl benzenes. So you, all, you change the size of the alkyl chain, you increase, and you put there the computational time. And the important thing is the CASPT2 method has this steep scaling, which we can show it grows with the fifth power of the molecular size. So you go to a few molecules, you double the size, the computation costs, and the calculation time increases 32 times, and soon you reach a computational wall. When you introduce local correlation, you change the scaling, and the best case that we saw was this orange curve here, and you see it grows linearly with a molecular size. This means if I double the system, calculation takes only twice as much. And this is the trick about uh, local correlation because the gains are larger for the larger systems. But gains mean nothing if you lose accuracy. So here you have uh, excitation energies for a few organic molecules that we calculated and you see only one value there. This value is deviation with respect to experimental data and this is data in solution against data in gas phase. So Technically, the deviation is even smaller. And you see, in average, we got 0.1 electron volts, and things work really nicely. You usually see one set of values for each molecule. This is because local and non local have exactly the same accuracy. So, after the PhD, I moved to wind engineering, and I did mostly thermophysical properties, some statistical mechanics. Chemical engineer I didn't do, but I worked very closely with chemical engineers and it was a very enriching experience. So what did I do exactly at Linde? I did physical properties. Linde is a leader in the gas industry and basically they do process engineering. So you have a process like this, you take a feed stream with some values, some composition and so on, and you process this stream using some operations that are very well described uh, in the chemical engineering literature, and in the end, you obtain a product with added value. So this is what the engineers do, and in order to be able to do this, they need to know how the system in each one of these stages behaves. So what's the composition, how is the viscosity change with temperature, so on and so forth. And these are physical properties, and they are everywhere. So physical properties is like a pillar for process engineering. <coughs> but what is this of physical properties? This is very vague. Well, it's actually vague itself. It can go from vapor pressures, densities, viscosity and other uh, transport properties, phase diagrams, entropies, entropies, heat capacities, anything is classified as being a physical property. And how do we deliver this to the engineer? We have software specific for that. So we were responsible for maintaining and extending the existing software at Linde. And I was actually lucky enough to work together with a former colleague of mine, Duncan, and write from scratch one of these physical property systems for the CFD group because of their special needs. And this is crazy work, it's amazing. Um, what else did I do? I did first principle physical property prediction because I'm a quantum chemist, I'm used to these things. And some properties you can actually estimate really nicely using quantum mechanics. I was a physical property responsible for petrochemicals at Linda, meaning that if petrochemistry 3 needed a property package, I was the one responsible for that. Uh, Linda Dresden, India, America, manager for databases there, supervision of students, and I was even representing Linde in a gremium of thermodynamics for the German 
for industry and academia of German speaking countries. One thing that is completely different between academia and industry is the impact of your work. I'm not going to tell you too much about this story, there's too much secrecy involved, but this is actually one of the last projects I worked with, I uh, worked on, and this took over more than one year. And together with a colleague of mine, it was very intensive work, we had to bring, make a technolo technology transfer between uh, BASF and Linde, and the final goal was to purify isobutene. You have here the link, you can have more information on this if you want. The story I would like to tell you about is a different one, it involves a bit more quantum chemistry. Um, one, about one month before I left Linde, a colleague of mine from Dresden calls me and says, Philippe, I have a problem. I have a string, a gas string, it contains nitrogen dioxide, and later on, this gas is going to be in contact with amines, and these can react and form carcinogenic species, and I need to make sure that nitrogen dioxide is removed from the system. So I do a wash. I do an outline wash. I pass the gas over water with a base, and um, I would need to be, make sure that the gas phase is clean from nitrogen dioxide. Can you show me? Can you help me here? And well, I took the, the problem at hands. I started looking in the literature. Nitrogen dioxide reacts with water. It's well described, but the thermodynamical properties of this reaction are not really particularly uh, well described because the moment nitrogen dioxide sees water, it reacts extremely violently. It forms fogs, it forms aerosols, it forms everything, and there's not really many uh, measurements of quality available in the literature. Uh, I then started to look for the theoretical literature, and there's plenty of people that studied the hydrolysis reaction in gas. Now, the most interesting fact about this is that in gas, nitrogen dioxide does not react does not react with water. So I was at an impasse and I could not really do much for my colleague. So I decided to take matter really in my hands and I did quantum chemistry on uh, the system. So I selected all the reactions that I found that could participate for the system here in gas or in water, irrespective of that. I chose the best quantum chemistry available to me. I calculated Gibbs free energies for these reactions and then using a solvation model, state of the art, corrected everything for uh, water. What I obtained was a big table like this here. I'm not gonna dissect the table, that's not the point. The important thing is that using quantum chemistry and solvation models, you can get Gibbs free energies for each and every reaction. You start to understand a bit better your system and you start seeing which reactions are important for which conditions. And taking this, I assembled uh, basically a, a script that would solve the equilibrium, taking only the important reactions. And with this, I generated concentration plots. So this starts already solving the equilibrium using quantum chemistry. We have number of moles of each and every species in the system uh, according to temperature, uh, initial concentration of nitrogen dioxide, and even the pH. So we can vary the, the, the physical conditions. We see the effect that those conditions have on the equilibrium and hopefully we understand better what the system is actually doing. And what we saw was that um, nitrogen dioxide is expected to react completely, completely as long as there is pH control. If there's no pH control, the pH drops, then uh, meet the acids that are formed, which are nitrous acid and nitric acid start decomposing, they form more NO2 and the reaction starts a cycle and there's a huge mess. So as long as there's pH control, we can get uh, rid of NO2. Now, this is really nice, but there's no backup of experimental data. This is the first place, it's, it's uh, the first place why I did quantum chemistry on this. What we can say, however, is that based on benchmarks that were run on similar systems, um, as close as possible to the, the system of interest here, we compared these three energies in gas phase calculated against experimental and for the demineralization of NO2, for instance, I was able to get for different temperatures a uh, deviation of tox one kilojoule per mole with respect to experimental data. So this is the best safety that we have, and I hope that this was good for my colleague. Now, I'd like to tell you a bit about a side project of mine. Um, about six months after I joined Linde, 
I started to mix quantum chemistry. And what I decided to do is to write my own quantum chemistry for, uh, program, which I name now Ulysses. Ulysses is basically doing semi empirical quantum chemistry. The methods are there. I use dispersion, hydrogen bonding corrections to improve the accuracy of these methods. And the main goal is to go to large systems, either a protein or a large ensemble of molecules. It does thermodynamics, ideal gas thermodynamics, and you can have some corrections for solution, do molecular dynamics, ab initio molecular dynamics here. And you may now ask, why is a person that did ab initio going to semi empirical, which is then the other extreme of quantum chemical methods? And the question, the answer to that is speed and efficiency. Semi empirical methods are extremely efficient. And to show you this, I would like to show you this protein here, which is called Krambi. It's a very small protein, uh, something a biologist would be shy of, but the quantum mechanics know because it has 640 atoms after adding protons. And I calculated this protein using my own program on my own PC at home. And the calculation times are, according to the method, of course, uh, one minute for some methods, two minutes for another method, which is extremely fast. I can put another protein like this and I the computational time increases, of course, seven minutes, seven minutes and a half, 26 minutes here, there's some convergence problems, uh, it's well understood and well justified. And these two proteins together are more or less the same size of the protein that you had in the previous slide and you had on that presentation, which is about 1,200 atoms. The other protein, it takes 11 minutes because all the atoms are bonded to one another. Again, the same problem here, you have speed against accuracy. So this is always a very big gain for quantum chemistry. And in order to show you that semi empirical methods can still be accurate, I run some benchmarks on the bucket catcher fullerene system. So this is a well-described system in the literature of chemical, of supramolecular chemistry. And you basically have this molecule here that has several conformations, and this is the bucket catcher. The bucket catcher, it's two units of paramolene, which is a polyaromatic molecule, bound together with this tether here. This molecule forms like a uh, cloud spin. It does this all the time. And when it sees a ice system like fullerene here, it goes and it grabs it to form a species like this. Um, I studied the whole system using semi empirical methods, different ones to see the, the effects. There, we characterized uh, gas phase thermodynamics in liquids, how this molecule behaves, transition states between species, everything was matching the best results that I have from DFT that others run. But this means nothing if then I cannot predict this interaction energy. And the great advantage of this system is that we have experimental data. These are the values in polymine and tetrachloroethane in kilocalories per mole. Even better than that, other theoreticians calculated this reaction. So I have a, better, a really good comparison between different methods. Stefan Grimme calculated this system using that density functional and a really big, a really big basis set, and they got the result of minus 9.2 kilocalories per mole in polymine. And this is 4.5 kilocalories per mole away from the experimental data. Ab initio failed miserably, other DFT model, uh, methods were really bad. So if I were able to get similar accuracy using semi empirical methods, I would be extremely happy because semi empirical is faster, so I would have a kind. To my big surprise, it actually beats the DFT. If you're curious why, you can approach me later and I'll tell you exactly the reasons why semi empirical was able to uh, have higher accuracy than DFT. And this was for different uh, solvents. This method here is one that I modified myself to have a bit better dispersion, but other methods that I used gave uh, similar accuracy. Uh, one thing that I was able to do, semi-empirical is economical, I can run molecular dynamics using semi-empirical. And what I did, I took the, the bucket catcher, I put the full rain on top of the bucket catcher, and I let them react or interact. And what you see is that the full rain goes to the side of the bucket catcher, it waits for the, the mouth or the arms of the bucket catcher to open, and then it jumps right in. And this process is basically very barrenness. I spent days looking for the transition states, everything failed, because there is no barrier for this process. Then after the complex is formed, it just stays stable over time. Now, um, since last August, I decided to take another turn in my life and change 
somehow the subject of what I'm working with, but in the end it boils down to the same, which is quantum chemistry to one way or another. So I joined the Helmholtz Institute at Munich with the intent of developing a new artificial intelligence system for aiding in drug discovery. I also support uh, structural biologists using quantum chemistry, and this proportionates the further development of the program itself, of course, so everything is uh, really nicely mixed. For the main project, I cannot tell you much because we are currently applying for a patent. So the very base idea of what we are trying to do is to turn things in a different perspective and we use artificial intelligence to understand the protein and in a way or another give out the ideal vegan for this protein. And this is basically uh, a slightly different um, approach. It's based on the previous model that a former colleague of ours developed for identifying water on the, pro on the surface of the protein. However, the AI that we're developing takes several steps. It's a really long process. It needs to be tested. Uh, when we have a protein and we try to find where the ligand is and which ligand to put there, we usually try to compare against experimental data. Now, proteins are kind of specific molecules and they like specific types of interactions. If you take a protein like this one here, you might find, or in this case, you will actually do find an experimental structure bound to a ligand, but you only have one. If our AI system is not able to predict this precise interaction here, we have no clue where we stand. And this is not good for development. So what we can do is, actually in this case I actually did, is to use quantum chemistry to quantify that. This protein here has 10,500 atoms, which is reasonably large or acceptably large for a biologist. For a quantum chemist, this is terribly large. And what I did was to actually run quantum chemistry on this using semi empirical methods because they're economical. So I take the protein, I take the ligand, I calculate them separately, I calculate the interaction energy, and I get a value in the end. Here you have, uh, we, we try to test our AI system. We let the AI tell us seven uh, best uh, interactions between the protein and different ligands, and this respective scoring of the AI. And then we did exactly the same using quantum chemistry on the full protein. Two things are really nice from this example. The first one is these two values down here, number five and number six. The AI saw these as not being the most favorable ones. The fact that everything is minus there, it's how the scoring system was built. But positions five and six are poorly scored on the AI and on the quantum chemistry side. This is because if you look at the structure, you have a um, an atom from the ligand overlapping the protein and atoms don't like to be on the same place, on the same spot, so the energy explodes. The other really nice thing is positions number two and number four, which you see are particularly well classified using both systems. This is because this is the natural pocket of the protein, just two different conformations of the same ligand. So if, even though we are using extremely low level quantum chemistry that is extremely economical, it's still good enough to see the, the actual pockets of the protein. Now, if this presentation would have taken place two weeks ago, it would have stopped here. But ever since two weeks, I started to work on a new project. And although I don't have many things to show uh, about this project, I want to just give you a hint of what I'm doing because I find it impressive. And to that, I need to introduce you the proteasome. For those of you that are biologists, the proteasome it's a protein that degrades other proteins. It's a massive molecular complex, hollow in the center. You basically unfold a protein, you pass it over the core of this cylinder, and you, out, you, you, can, you get amino acids. So this is a machinery of destruction that the cell has. This hole is so narrow that this is a protection of the cell against itself. So you need something to activate, something to force the protein inside the hole in order for the protein to be decomposed. One of the activators is called K200. This is my colleague Manike, she's working on the system. And 20S, which is the core cylinder with two K200, it's a molecular complex of, of almost 71,000 atoms, uh, heavy atoms. This means for quantum chemists, you need to add uh, protons, which double the number of atoms. So you have almost 140,000 atom, 140, atoms in the system. I'm not doing calculation on this. I'm studying 
with my colleague the PA200, which is also nothing to be shy of, 28,600 atoms after adding the protons. The most interesting thing about this is that we have experimental structures. This is the experimental structure of PA200, and you always find two molecules attached there. One is this one here, which is inositol phosphate 6. You have the sugar and you have the six phosphate groups there attached to the sugar. The other is this derivative of uh, inositol phosphate 4, and they're both there. No one knows why, no one knows how strongly they are bound to the protein. They just are. And what we're doing is trying to use quantum chemistry to quantify this. So I take the whole protein, and the whole protein is treated at the quantum chemical level. So in this moment, I'm still trying to determine the protonation state of IP6, which is this molecule here in the protein. What I found was, if I take the molecule and I completely reprotonate it, because I can do it in the computer, though it's not a real state, but I'm trying to understand how the system behaves. If I take inositophosphate, I take all the protons from the phosphate groups, I put it in the protein, I get that the inositophosphate lost one electron almost. Okay, it gave it to protein. You can see it this way, or if you use um, the, the, the tools of quantum chemistry, you try to understand things a bit better. The problem here is that this is a really large protein, it's 28,000 atoms. And if you try to have a closer look to the protein, this is the view that you have. You cannot do anything from this. So you need something a bit more. Fortunately, we have something like population analysis. And if I run population analysis on this molecule, and I was able to determine until now, that one of the phosphate groups, this one here in particular, it stole a, pro a proton from the protein, so to say. So this explains why the charge transfer of one electron, which is not one electron, but it's actually one proton. So they exchange, the, there's a, a, an exchange of proton. So until now, I have indication that IP6, that molecule, is bound to one proton. To, it, it, it has still one proton when bound to the protein. I'm still trying to determine how the whole process takes place. But nevertheless, uh, things are moving forward. And with this, I would like to come to the end. I hope I was able to show you that quantum chemistry is actually more useful for the different fields of chemistry than one might think of. From the really small, like nitrogen dioxide, to the very large, a protein of 28,000 atoms. Uh, I hope I didn't leave the wrong message about different methods. In my opinion, the quantum chemical method is more like a solvent for the experimentalist. You cannot go to the laboratory and use the same solver for all reactions. It doesn't work. Different solvents express different properties of your system. The same happens here with the theoretical methods. EFT failed on this system. It's amazing in other fields. Semi empirical fails in other fields. It was behaved extremely well in this. And it's basically the quantum chemist that needs to know the methods well enough to say which method should be more appropriate for which application. So there are no bad methods, only inappropriate application of this. And more important, size is not a limitation. The question that you ask and how you put this question, this is a limitation. With this, I would like to thank all the people in my life, people from the masters, PhD, the physical property group at Linda, it was a, an amazing place to work in uh, there. And now Helmut, Gregor, Michael, and Eva for giving me the opportunity to come back to the academia. My colleague Thiel, Jan, and the guys from Pombo for the AI project, Maraike for the PA200, and of course the whole SAPA group, uh, the organic chemists as well. They make an amazing place to work, and it's really fascinating. And of course, you for your kind attention. Thank you very much.